<laughs> now, the first thing I'm going to talk about <coughs> is my book is on Laura Evans. Now, Laura Evans ran a parlor house in Salida from 1913 until December 1949. She started in 1896 working at, in Denver. She worked in Leadville. She also worked in, in Central City. And then she ended up in Salida in 1900. Now, the one thing it's that people need to understand is that there's differences between a parlor house girl and a crib house girl. A lot of the movies that you see, the girls are wearing small little short dresses, little can-can dresses, everything's hanging out. That's a crib girl. A parlor house girl is what Laura was. Parlor house girls dressed in the best clothes, fur coats, jewelry. During the day, a parlor house girl would take singing lessons and drawing lessons, and she would learn different instruments, the piano, the flute perhaps, so when the men all came into parlor houses, they were the high-end clientele men. These were the rich men. These were the mine owners. They would come in. They would have elegant dinners. There was maids. There were servants. There was bouncers. Now, when a man would come into a parlor house, the man would purchase one of these. This is called a brass check. Now, the man would go up to the madam, and he would purchase a brass check, or two or three, depending on what kind of night he wanted to have. When he went and found his girl a choice, he would give her this brass check to go up to her room. In her room, in her nightstand, she would open the drawer, and there would be a small little coin box. It was nailed into her nightstand, so he could not take his coin back. He would then go, and he would insert it into the little box, and then they would go, and they would do their, their business. Well, the next morning, when everything was said and done, the madam had the only key. She would unlock that box and pay the girl half of what she had earned. The other half went to her room and board. They had the best food, three meals a day, and everything was taken care of. Now, when it comes to a parlor house, the clientele changes. They want new girls. They want fresh meat to come in, not the same girls all the time. So after a couple of months, when the girls started getting stale, they were fired and the new girls were brought in. Now, if a girl wanted to stay in parlor houses, she would have to move to a new town, normally would change her name. Then she would start all over again. But if she wanted to stay in that town and she liked the clientele, maybe had some regulars that really wanted her to stick around, she would get a crib. A crib was a two-room apartment, one story. Um, let's take in Cripple Creek, for example, they had Poverty Gulch. In, on Myers Avenue, you had all the parlor houses on one end of Myers Avenue. At the end, you had these small little one-room shacks. Well, they were two-room shacks. And then you would go down there, and the girls' names would be written above each of the doors, Frankie or Glenda or Mary, up above each of the ones. Then, when you went into these rooms, some of them were very fancy, <coughs> wallpaper, lace curtains. The girls, they rented these just like you would an apartment. Then they got to keep all the money that they earned. The, some of the girls would put up the wallpapers. Most of them had drawings or photographs of people having sex, kind of get the guy in the mood like he needed any help. Now on payday, the mines would actually pay the miners on different days of the week. That way they wouldn't storm the cribs on payday. Now, there was in, in my chapter on Cripple Creek, Laura and her friend Jesse, who had just gotten hired to work at the House of Mirrors for Jeannie Rogers, who owned the House of Mirrors first in Denver, she sent the girls down to Leadville to work for a year as an internship so they could learn the ins and outs of what they were doing. Once they knew what they were doing, then after their year was up, they could then go back and work at the House of Mirrors. Very, very high clientele. When they or on their way, they stopped in Cripple Creek, they spoke to some of the parlor girls, and they spoke to some of the crib girls. The crib girl that they spoke to said that on payday, she could, earn, she could have 70 men in one evening. Now, there was different prices for different girls. The paler your skin and the redder your hair, the more money you could make. Also, if you spoke French, you could actually make twice what you could make if you didn't speak French. Men were convinced French girls were better in bed. So the parlor house girls would dye their hair red, and they also got on laudium, an opiate. It actually made their skin extremely ashy white, glazed their eyes, made their job a little bit easier, stayed out of the sun, and were able to get more money. Now, in Salida, when Laura Evans opened up her area, she actually bought the entire block of parlor houses in 1913 because Salida was threatening to close everything down. So everybody wanted to get out. Well, Laura thought, you know what? If they do close everything down, these are apartments. I'll just rent them out to the railway men. 
Well, she bought the entire block, which included two two-story tall um, parlor houses and numerous one-story tall cribs. Now, her cribs, she did differently. They were simply one-story apartments with two rooms like the other ones. They had a bedroom, a little seating area, a kitchen, and a private bathroom. But the girls could come to the parlor house and have their meals. They could join in the parties, pick up lays. So it was a different setup because she had seen how the crib girls in the other towns have been kind of brushed aside, so she wanted to do a little bit differently. Luckily, in Salida, in 1913, they realized this grave mistake, that they'd actually had based the fines that the girls were sent to pay the police, the fire department, and the mayor. Well, when they closed down the red light district, there was no money that was coming in to pay all that, so within weeks, they opened her back up. She was closed December 1949, only because the commander at Camp Hale came down and insisted that she be closed because all of his men kept leaving base to come down to her parlor house from Leadville. That is why she got closed down. <laughs> now, um, does anybody here know why it was called the clap? Anybody know what was called the clap? One of Laura's girls got interviewed about the same time that Laura got interviewed, or Laura was interviewed in the late 1940s into the early 1950s, up until weeks before she died, by a man named Fred Missoula. Fred Missoula had promised her a biography. So she told him dialogue, she told him every single story, she told him everything that she could think of in order to get her biography. That's why my book is written in novel form, because I was able to, due to the dialogue, the descriptions that she gave, all the way down to what color someone's hair was and what the weather was like. She was just on point for everything. He also interviewed two of her girls. One of her girls, Fern, explained exactly how you check a man for different things and what happens when a man has to clap. Seems that the reason it's called the clap is when a man gets the clap, his urethra fills up with pus. The pus then hardens. He now can't pee. So in order for him to pee, and that's why it's called the clap. <laughs> yeah, it's a little painful. Now, now, when a man did have a, a venereal disease, such as the clap, the only treatment at that time was for the doctor to take this little injector and put it up the pee hole and inject these small little pills of mercury up into the man's bladder. Now, he would continue to do this until the man foamed at the mouth. <laughs> Now, any sores that were on the body or anywhere on the body, you would actually rub mercury cream onto the sores to burn them off of your body. Now, despite this, men still refused to wear condoms. And they would lay with these girls. I mean, imagine being a guy, you come out of the mines and there's 70 men lined up out each and <coughs> every one of those cribs and you're still refusing to wear a condom. It's a little creepy. Now, um, the one thing that we're gonna talk about with Laura is when Laura worked at the, um, she worked for Jeannie Rogers at the House of Mirrors, she worked in Salida, she also worked in Leadville. Now when she worked in Leadville, anyone who's ever heard of Laura Evans knows, she snuck $25,000 up to a mine in order for the scabs from Missouri who are running the mine during the strike not to leave. Now, there's a lot of speculation that says, oh, she broke the mining strike. Well, one little five foot six woman that weighs 80 pounds is not gonna break an entire mining strike because she snuck money up to one mine. No, the parlor house that she was living in was owned by a man named Mr. Moffat. Mr. Moffat owned a lot of the mines up in Leadville. During the strike, anybody in, has ever been to Leadville knows that in Leadville, the mines fill up with water. <coughs> they just fill up and fill up. So when the miners went on strike, he hired scabs to run his mine simply to run the pumps to keep everything from flooding. Well, the Maid of Aaron mine had $25,000 that the men were due because every time someone snuck the money up, they'd get shot. So Laura Evans decided that she was gonna put an end to this because those men were some of her lays. And if they left, she was out of work. So she took a bustle. Now a bustle is worn just tie it around your waist like that, and they're coming different sizes, and it puffs your butt out so you have a little Kardashian boot. And she goes, and she slit the thing open, and she stuffed it with $25,000, let it all nice and flat, sewed it back up, put it underneath of her riding jacket, and she went up to that mine. 
There you go. You can have that. <laughs> so so she, she went up to that mine, and she snuck that money up. Now, the only thing is, is that these men were shooting at anybody who came up. So she had a trick pony. Now, her trick pony was taught by her that she could lay a shotgun right between his ears. She could ride down a hill, shoot at things, and he wouldn't flinch. Now, this is the pony that she took up to that mine because she knew she was going to get shot at. So she took the pony up, laid that gun right between his ears, fired at everybody. The miners, the scabs that were in the mine, knew she was coming. They also fired at all the militia men and the striking miners, were able to get her down the hill and into the Maid of Aaron mine. They got her and the horse into the building and closed the door. She then went into the manager's office, and she hiked up her dress, and she was taking off her bustle to hand it to him. And he looked at her, and he goes, you're not going to piss on my floor, are you? And she goes, no. So she takes it off, and she shoved it in his, in his chest, and she says, here's your goddamn money, and I'll get me out of here. So she got back on her horse and they actually led the horse through the mine with all those noisy pumps and all the noise. She kept the horse calm, they got out to the opposite side, and she ended up having to shoot at a couple people on the way out, but she did get out safely. She then went to Denver, she kind of laid low until the mine strike was over, and then she did come back. Now, the slideshow I'm going to show you is her actual pictures. When I went and I was able to get hold of all of her interviews, there's two boxes of interviews done with Laura and her two girls, Lillian and Fern. You'll see a picture of Fern on the, on the slideshow. I also was able to find Laura Evans' great-grandsons. The thing that was kind of ironic was is that her great-grandsons are devout Mormons. Now, it seems that it changes for generation to generation. It was shameful, it was shameful. Now, they think great-grandma's really cool. Now, all three of these guys are in their early 80s. Me and my kids went up to, up to Salt Lake City, spent an entire weekend with the family. We even got to go to Temple. <laughs> it's really a very pretty building. And then we spent the entire evening going through and making copies of Laura's personal diaries. And we spent two hours at Walmart scanning all of her personal photos. The pictures you're going to be seeing and the pictures that are in the book are from her own personal album. The thing I like about it is that movies have shown that these girls were just beautiful, glamorous. No, they weren't. Most of these girls were not very cute and they weren't very small. But easy is easy. So, <laughs> so I'm going to be showing you the slideshow. <laughs> And then you can understand the way that everybody looked. And let's see, is, is that one plugged? Oh, okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. Do you want to turn the light off a little bit? Now, the reason I have this den a little bit lower is some of the pictures are actually upright and it cuts Jack Dempsey's head off in the middle. So I had to lower it a little bit so you can see Jack Dempsey's face. He's a good looking guy. We shouldn't be hiding him. Now, this here is Denver in 1896. Now, the thing that fascinates me is I didn't realize they had this much stuff in Denver in 1896. Now, when Laura first came from Missouri, she had originally had married a man named John Cooper Evans. His parents were extremely, extremely wealthy. Now, her, uh, now him and Laura went and had a little girl. Now, he ended up losing his entire inheritance and going broke. She didn't want to be poor anymore. She was used to all the fine things. So she took the baby, got on a train, and came to Denver. Now, she went into a boarding house, had the boarding house madam went and watched the baby for her, and she went and got a job at a dress shop. Wasn't making very much money. Then she went to Cripple Creek to go be a blackjack dealer. Still wasn't making as much money as she wanted. Then she learned all about polar houses, started interviewing the girls, and my, ch my first chapter is a very, very interesting way of an initiation into a parlor house. In my first chapter, you will read that there are certain things that they asked the girls that they needed to do to be in a parlor house. Laura refused, and because she refused, she was hired at the House of Mirrors. Seems that Jeannie Rogers only hired girls that wouldn't do that little parlor trick. Now this is the House of Mirrors, it's still in existence. It's not a parlor house anymore, of course. Now Lodo's is the restaurant attached to the side. Now this building was built in the mid 1800s. The parlor house is on your right, it's three stories tall. Now the one on the left, that always has been a restaurant. It was built as a restaurant. And everything was so normal in those days with the parlor houses. Men would bring their wives and children to eat in that restaurant. Now if you go there now, they have turned it, the parlor house section into a museum. You can go in, you can walk around, 
And upstairs, they actually have framed little plaques that help to tell the story of how it used to be a parlor house, and you can tour it. Now, this is Jeannie Rogers. Now, Jeannie Rogers was six foot tall, always wore green emerald earrings. Now, if you've heard of the House of Mirrors, you've heard it called Maddie's House of Mirrors. Maddie and Jeannie Rogers were rivals. Jeannie Rogers died of Bright's disease in the early 1900s. That's a kidney ailment. When she died, Maddie Silks quickly snatched up the House of Mirrors and renamed it Maddie's House of Mirrors. Now, if you go, you will see in front of the Pollard House, she had a mason go and take small tiles and, and put M Silks right at the front doorway on the ground, just despite Jeannie Rogers. This is one of the few pictures that actually exists of the inside of the House of Mirrors. Now, Laura explains, as you can see in this picture, the walls were covered in bird's eye maple with mirrors everywhere, floor to ceiling. Now, after everything got closed down and the parlor houses were no longer parlor houses, around 1913 to 1915, they start closing everything down. The building was purchased to be a Buddhist temple. Now, these men went and they dismantled the entire parlor house on all these things got sold off. Now that ugly chandelier you see hanging there is not the original. The original Laura describes was a huge six foot wide crystal chandelier that hung, reflected off all of these mirrored walls. This staircase here leads up to the girls' rooms. Now originally these walls that are now plywood were covered in floral wallpaper. When Jeannie Rogers owned it, it was also covered in framed mirrors and framed paintings of people having sex. Now, when Maddie Silks bought the place, she trained and bred horses. So for some reason, she took down the mirrors, left the, left the paintings of people having sex, and also included pictures of horses. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to put in a parlor house. <laughs> now, this here is Leadville. Now, when Laura went to go do her one-year internship in Leadville, it was 1896, and this here is Leadville. <laughs> And this was her first room. Now you have to understand, a parlor house is extremely fancy. There was just one bathroom with a tub at the end of the hall. The girls had chamber pots and washstands in their rooms. As you can see, the best carpeting, the best curtains, the best furniture, their rooms were very fancy. Now this picture was taken her first night at the parlor house to introduce the new girls. The lady in the center is Miss Glenn, that is their madam. The girl over on the left-hand side in a long sleeve white shirt, her name is Joy. Laura Evans is sitting right next to her in the black shirt. Across from Laura with the white long sleeve shirt and a little doily on her head is Jessie. Jessie will stay her best friend for 17 years. The lady in the striped dress is Della. Now in my Leadville chapter, you will read the unfortunate demise of Della, which was actually pretty common back in the day. It wasn't all butterflies and flowers when it came to parlor houses. After their one turn year internship, the girls were then sent back to Denver to work at the House of Mirrors. Now, Jeannie Rogers informed them the parlor house was full, but she owned many parlor houses in Denver. These two here are Market Street. The one that um, Jesse and Laura were set up is the one on the right with the awning over the door. After a couple of her friends got murdered, she got tired of being in Denver and her and Jesse hopped the train and came back to Leadville. They then went and rented from the boarding house that was owned by Mr. Moffat, one of the rich millionaires who also owned the mines. Not all the mines, but just a couple of the mines. This suede riding jacket here is the exact one that she wore when she went up to the mines with that bustle tucked underneath of her jacket. This is her friend, Jesse. Now, according to Laura, Jesse is wearing Laura's favorite dress. They actually fought over it before these pictures were taken. This is the maid of Erin Mine. Not exactly the most glamorous thing. This is the one that Laura rode a horse, Bobby and shot at over these bridges to get into that building to deliver that money and then quickly had to go over the bridges again while being shot at so she could get back to town. This is the exact bustle that she wore. You can see all the stitching up at the top where she had slid it open. Now, $25,000 back then, they actually had $1,000 bills. So they actually had $500 bills, $1,000 bills. So she didn't put 25,000 ones in there, but she laid them all nice and flat and she stitched it back up. Now, the one thing she describes with their outfits is that she explained to Nick, who was her boyfriend at the time and also worked for Mr. Moffat, when she offered to do it, she said, look, she said, in order to fit into this dress, she says, I have 
paper in my tits, I have paper in my ass, everything's fake, they're not going to check anything, I have plenty of places to hide this money. This is the Ice Palace. I wish Leadville would rebuild the Ice Palace, it's really cool. Unfortunately, it was only up for a couple months and then it melted. <laughs> now, the one thing that they had during their Ice Palace Carnival was toboggan rides. Now, these toboggan rides, they went down Harrison Avenue and they also went down another street. Now, what they did was, is this one here down Harrison is, a, is 1,200 feet long. What you would do is you would pay maybe a quarter to ride the toboggan down, but to re-get their money, they actually charged you $2 to take the carriage back up the hill to ride it again. <laughs> now on press day, the mayor wanted these toboggans to go as fast as possible, so he actually had them grease the rails with hog's fat just to make them as slippery as possible, and that must have smelled terrible. <laughs> This is inside the ice palace. This is the ice skating rink. Now, these wood beams that you see are not actually sitting on top of the ice. There was actually a wooden pavilion that was originally built. The ice is actually set against it. The whole idea originally was to leave the pavilion up all year long, simply rebuild the ice palace in the winter, and then reuse it at the pavilion <laughs> during the summer. Unfortunately, they ended up tearing this thing down within a couple of years and they never rebuilt it. Now, one thing Laura does mention in her interviews was that the Ringling Brothers came and did her circus. One of the days of the circus, they put ice skates on the camels and the camels were ice skating on this. If anybody, anybody knows where that picture is, I'd love to see it because I have looked everywhere. Now, this gives you an example of how the ice palace was built. Each of these blocks were hand cut and in order to glue them together, they would pour boiling hot water on them and then stick them together like that. Now, these were also, of course, lit with electric lights. You can see all the cords. Now, they also went and they uh, made some of them hollow. They embedded them with flowers and dead fish and taxidermied animals. And it was just quite, quite a sight to see. This is Mr. Winfield Stratton. Now, Stratton was one of the multi-multi-millionaires that got very, very rich in Cripple Creek. Now, Mr. Stratton, unfortunately, where there's money, there's greed. And so many people tried to steal his money and take him to court and do everything they could to steal his money from him. He became a chronic alcoholic. Now, in my Leadville chapter, you'll read about the wonderful weekend him and Laura spent up in Leadville, where he actually gave her a secret to keep, which she did. Upon his death, at and I think he was like 54 when he died. So this picture is actually of an early 50 year old man. <laughs> she was very, very happy to see that he had kept his promise and his will. And you'll have to read about that in the Salida chapter. This here is Salida. She came down here in 1900. If you're familiar with Salida, that mountain in the back has an S on it right now. That was not built until about 1930. There on the left-hand side is an entire block of stores with a little tower on the top. Also, if you've been to Salida, that entire block was dynamited back in the 1980s to make room for that Pebble Bank and Trust parking lot that you see on F Street. That's what used to sit there. Now, when she lived in, in Salida for a couple of years, she started realizing that she was not going to be able to buy that parlor house that she wanted and be her own madam. So she decided she was going to go try a different town. She took five of her girls and her piano player and they went to Central City. Now, the house that she rented is three houses up from the church. It was owned by a tiny little woman named Lou Bunch. <laughs> this is Lou Bunch. <laughs> Now, in my chapter on Central City, Laura talks about the interesting dinner that Lou Bunge made everybody and the way that the house was, and the house was pretty much was falling apart. They only lived there for about six months. All the mines got shut down. Laura broke her lease and returned back to Salida. Well, the night before, she had some ladies that were in the house and they had made a bet with her. It seems that down at Black Hawk, there was going to be a masquerade ball. Well, painted um, ladies were not allowed into masquerade balls. So one of the men said, I'll bet you $50 that you can't sneak into that masquerade ball and not be noticed. He says, if you can sneak in, spend the whole night there like everybody else and not be noticed, I'll pay you your $50. So she thought, what is the one outfit I can wear? No one will know I'm a soiled dove. <laughs> this one. <laughs> If you notice, it's made out of sheets and blankets that she found around her house. 
Now, the reason that this picture was taken was after everything was said and done, she got her $50, she went back to Salida. One of her friends told a photographer in Denver what she had done. He contacted her, paid for her to go to Denver, and took this picture. He wanted to enter it in a national photo contest. Well, a couple months later, she got this picture in the mail in a small frame. The man included a letter saying he had won first prize. Mm -hmm. Well, written on the back of the picture said pretty much that she was an alcoholic and a prostitute. <laughs> and she said, well, if he just would have wrote murderer on the back, he probably could have got grand prize. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in 1913, like I mentioned earlier, Laura was able to purchase the entire block, which included two parlor houses. The larger parlor house is the one that she herself moved into. She built a one-floor a one bedroom off to the side because, as she put it, I will not have anybody sleep above me. This here is one of her upstairs bedrooms for the girls. Now, you'll see that there's dolls and toys on the bed. Now, a lot of times, the women would have their favorite lays. The men would gift them with dolls, and with toys. The reason being is the different um, birth control devices and treatments the girls would use to prevent getting pregnant would mainly make them sterile. They could not have children, so the men would gift them with dolls and toys to kind of help with that missing maternal feeling. <laughs> this is two of Laura's girls. You have Verda on the left and Hazel on the right. Now Hazel, you'll read in my Salida chapters, she actually helps Laura with Laura's first two suicides, which happened within days of each other. The two of them had to run around and try to find the bodies. The first woman, this is Nora. Now, Nora committed suicide by taking an entire bottle of mercury tablets. Now, it's a very painful, long, drawn-out death. It took her a couple weeks to die while it ate her insides and she foamed at the mouth. Now, the reason that she killed herself was because her favorite lay did not want to marry her. <laughs> This lady here, she named herself Dick Diamond Valentine. Now, Dick Diamond was in her 40s, and Laura did not want to hire her as a prostitute. She offered her housekeeping. She offered her cook. Nope, she insisted, I want to be a prostitute. When she was younger, she had been a madam. She'd also been a prostitute. Well, she had her favorite lay, who she was sneaking around to, to see what he was doing. Seems that he wouldn't marry her either. So she was peeking in a window to see what he was doing, and she lost her balance and fell down a flight of stairs and broke her back. Now, Dick Diamond was in the hospital for two years and they, as they went and put bars in her back. When she was released, she could not bend at all. Her back, her waist, and her neck were stiff. Her girls would call her the, um, the wax image. So when she came down to work for Laura, she wanted to prove to herself that she could still work. Laura did not want to hire her as a girl, but she swore, yes, please, please, please. Within a couple weeks, she had also killed herself by taking the mercury tablets. You figure if you watch your, your former inmate there go and take mercury tablets and suffer for three weeks, you think of another way to kill yourself, but no, they both took mercury tablets. Now, this is one of the bedrooms inside of one of the one-story cribs. Now, Laura's cribs, like I mentioned, she simply had as an extension of her parlor house. These were one-story apartments, and this is one inside one of the rooms with one of the little beds in it. This is Laura's dog. Now, Laura's dog's name is Mr. Pimp Powers. <laughs> Now, Laura had a girl, her name was Lillian Powers. Well, after about nine years, Lillian saved enough money and had bought a house in Florence, Colorado to start her own parlor house. She bought this little puppy to give to Laura to make her feel better. So Laura named the puppy after Lillian. So he was Mr. Pimp Powers. Laura won and bought a high chair and she got this big, huge, fluffy pillow. The dog sat on that high chair on the big, fluffy pillow every night and watched everybody play poker. Well, the dog lived to be 14 years old. Well, one night, 3 o'clock in the morning, Laura said she looks over and she announced, well, looks like the dog's dead. <laughs> this is one of Laura's uh, more masculine girls. <laughs> this is one of her prettier girls. You can see we're getting into the 1920s in this picture, the thin eyebrows and the hairstyle. This is Jack Dempsey. Now, Jack Dempsey was a famous boxer. He was from Manassa, Colorado. Now, in my tunnel book, anyone who has seen my, sh my um, presentation on the tunnel book, in Salida, underneath of, the, um, of one of the buildings, is a huge 10-foot uh, tall walled gymnasium underneath one of the buildings. The tunnels lead to this gymnasium. 
Laura, in, in my Salida chapters, she went with her girls to watch Jack Dempsey fight in that exact gymnasium. Now, after he had his fight, his guys went and had a wonderful weekend over in Laura's place. Only problem was they had too much fun. By five o'clock in the morning, her place was a hospital. The guys had broken bones, broken ribs. One girl had a broken pelvis, and she ended up spending the next month caring for everybody in her parlor house. This is Laura and two of her girls celebrating the end of World War II. Now, in this picture, you can see Laura has kind of adapted the Hugh Hefner look. She has the silk pajamas, she has a silk robe. Now, she has gotten back to when she used to deal blackjack, and she's wearing the poker visor. This is Laura posing with Fern. Fern's one of her girls and is one of that got interviewed by Fred Mazzola after Laura died. She's the one who gave me all the sexual information on how to check men for collapse, venereal diseases, and how to take care of anything in, in regards to birth control back then. Now, Laura always wore high necks, long sleeves, and floor-length dresses her entire life up until her death. That's how she was raised, and she felt, if you want to see it, you need to pay for it. This is Laura when she was in her early 80s. She was almost 82 when she died. Now, the lady sitting next to her's name is Mary Humphrey. Now, Mary Humphrey worked as a prostitute in Salida and had nicknamed herself Nigger Mary, 200 pounds of quivering passion. <laughs> now, one of the men I met in Salida was almost 100 years old and had talked about all the times he spent down on Sackett Street visiting all the different girls. He said that Nigger Mary would sit on her front stoop and she did not wear panties. And she would sit on the stoop and she would pull up her dress and try to solicit the men. She would also would brag, baby, I don't even have any teeth. <laughs> when Laura was closed down December 1949, they of course insisted she had to put a no girl sign up. She can still, she's still wearing her silk robes and her visor. And she also always has her famous cigarettes with her cigarette holders in her hand. This is Laura's parlor house. Now, right now, it is owned by the Shriners. Now, the bedroom that's off there by the right, that was torn down by the Shriners after buying the building. They said it was falling apart. The first floor windows on the main parlor house, for some reason, were removed and stuccoed over. I don't know why. Now, off to the left, right attached to the parlor house is a white set of one-story tall cribs. Now, the Shriners also bought those, removed all the doors and windows, stuck it over, and that is now where the Shriners have their bar and their bathroom areas. Now, this here is the building on July 25th that I will be doing a special presentation in her parlor house from 11 until 2 and from 5 until 8. We will be joined by the museum. We will be bringing in vintage furniture and trying to recreate the first floor the best we can to show everybody what kind of person Laura was. This is Laura's funeral. Now that man sitting there with the Bible is Mr. Joe Stewart. Now, he owned the mortuary and they also drove the ambulance, which I found kind of funny. I guess they got to decide if you were gonna make it or not, I suppose. Now the girls off to the um, left on the right hand side, one of the girls is her daughter. The other ones are her former girls. All the other men are city councilmen and the railway workers that were renting all of her rooms after she got closed down. Despite being a madam, she was very highly respected in Salida. She attended the city council meetings. The mayor would ask her advice. She was friends with everybody. She was a very, very intelligent businesswoman. Now the man there, he, Mr. Stewart holding the Bible, his son, Joe Stewart Jr., who was in his 80s, late 80s, he just passed away last year, lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Me and my family drove down there, spent a whole weekend with Mr. Stewart. He gave us information during the interview that was just amazing, which I will tell, I'll tell you about when the, I'm done with the slideshow. Now, Mr. Stewart here was extremely mad. Not a single church in Salida would do Laura's funeral. <laughs> despite the fact that in the 30s, she paid for an entire new roof on one of the churches when the, when the roof burned off. Nobody would do her funeral. Mr. Stewart said, this woman's a queen. I'm gonna give her the funeral that she deserves. He also made sure she had the biggest flower arrangement that's ever been seen in Salida. She also had a satin lined coffin with the, um, oh, what is that fuzzy stuff you put on the outside of stuff? It's not suede. Velvet, velvet, thank you. Yeah, she had a pink flowered velvet on the outside of her coffin. And that is the end of that.
and then I will explain to you the interesting stories that Mr. Stewart told us about Laura and her girls. Excuse me. The thing that Mr. Stewart had explained to us was that as the mortician's son, they, their job was to simply, when, so, when a police officer called them up and they said, okay, we have somebody who's either dead or dying in their house, you need to go get them. They would go and take one of those old army cots, go into the house. For example, when it came to Laura's parlor house, she had two. She had her main parlor house, the one that you see in the picture. At the very end, she had a second parlor house. During the Depression, she was running out of money to help support the people of Salida to make sure they had food and coal and different things that they didn't really seem to appreciate, but she didn't want them to go hungry. She sold her second parlor house. She got it in half. One side she sold to Nigger Mary, the other side she sold to a lady named Margaret Weber. She was a Cherokee Indian lady. Very healthy, very pretty lady. Only problem was, Mr. Stewart explained that Margaret Weber became very ill at one point with severe stomach pains. She, they, they were called, they took her to the hospital, she dropped dead. No one could figure out why, because she seemed very healthy. Well, him and his father removed the body and took it to the mortuary. Well, they did an autopsy. What could possibly have killed this healthy woman? She was only like 54 years old. Well, Margaret Weber suffered from something called pica. Pica is where you eat non-food items, maybe laundry soap or dirt. When it came to Margaret Weber, she would suck the sulfur and salt and the glass off of matches. <laughs> that was her thing. Only problem was these were wood matches and she would swallow the match when she was done. <laughs> When Mr. Stewart and his father opened her up, she looked like a porcupine. He said that it was sticking out from her esophagus, her stomach, and her intestines were all the wooden matchsticks were all sticking out. Now, a couple months later, Nigger Mary was beaten to death by her nephew. Laura hadn't seen her for a couple of days, went to go check on her, and called the police when she couldn't get the door open. The police came up, thought that it was a dead body on the floor, so they called Mr. Stewart. He explained, Mr. Stewart Jr. explained to me, that him and his father got the cot and they went in there. They said the nephew was passed out over there on the bed. His knuckles were all bloody and bruised. They just left him there for the cops to deal with. There was Nigger Mary laying on the floor and they figured she was dead. They went and checked, she had a pulse. So they went and they took her to the hospital. The hospital said, she's gonna stop breathing soon, we don't want her. And he said, she's alive, you have to take her. And he goes, no, she's, she's unconscious, she's probably gonna be dead in a couple hours. Just take her back to the mortuary, wait till she stops breathing. He said, no. <laughs> so he takes her to a nursing home and he spends the afternoon helping the nurses clean her up, clean up her wounds. Now, Nigger Mary did not regain consciousness. She did die a couple days later at the, nurse, at the nursing home. Then he took her to the mortuary. Now, one very gruesome story that Mr. Stewart shared with me, which I'll share with you. When it comes to prostitution, you have girls that do it for different reasons. This was the Old West, of course, up until the 1940s. It's the same things that happen now. You have like Laura, she simply wanted pretty things. She wanted fur coats, she wanted diamonds, and this is the way she could get it. You could either work for a dollar a day as a waitress or a dollar a lay. <laughs> It's your choice. She wanted the dollar a lay so she could get the fur coats and the diamonds. You also have the girls of the Victorian era who were taught, if you sleep with a man and he doesn't marry you, you're ruined. No one's ever, ever gonna want you. So these girls figured, okay, well, let's go be prostitutes. So they would go up to the mining camps and do their business because they were taught, you're ruined, you might as well just go do that. Then you had the third type, who say you have a wagon train with an entire family. They're coming over from the East Coast. They're gonna go to Cripple Creek and open up a hardware store. They pack all their things, the whole family goes. There's bandits, there's Indians, there's robbers, there's diseases. By the time they get up there, maybe it's mom, three kids, two stray kids that she found somewhere else that have been abandoned. She can't go and, su and support all these kids being a washerwoman up at Cripple Creek. So she would end up becoming a prostitute. So there was different reasons that these girls become prostitutes. Now, when it came to this one girl back in the 1940s, she was 13 years old when she was caught with a 30 year old man. The police caught him. They told him either you marry her or you're going to jail. So he married her, of course, that's kind of how it works. He went and got a, a job in Salida at the bakery. They start very, very early. So he would take his little wifey into Salida with him. And she'd go, okay, honey, go find something to do while I work, and then we'll go back home. Well, she found something to do. She rented a room in the second parlor house from Margaret Weber. So she was up in the room. She was kind of a big girl, husband didn't know. 
Finally, one of his friends came to the bakery and said, you know what little wife he's doing? He went up to the room, found her completely naked sitting on the bed. Well, unfortunately, the man she was waiting for was a man the husband did not like. These two had problems, and this was the man that she was going to be sleeping with. She told her husband, I'm not leaving because so-and-so is coming. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. You know those old-fashioned irons, the ones you heat up on the wood stove that are about that thick of metal? Yeah, he beat her to death with it. <laughs> Then he went to the police station and he said, I just killed my wife. <laughs> Mr. Stewart said the police went, they checked out the scene. They were so grossed out, they, they called up Mr. Stewart and they said, you got to go get her. She's not dead, but she's trying to be dead. <laughs> so Mr. Stewart and his dad picked up that cot. They went up that parlor house steps. She didn't have a face anymore. <laughs> He said that there was a 200-pound woman convulsing like a wild animal on the bed. He said it took every ounce of their strength to get her onto that cot and strapped in. They finally got her on the cot, took her to the hospital. Well, he knew what had happened with Nigger Mary, and he was not about to go and let this girl not be seen. He took her straight into the emergency room. They set that cot on the table and just stood there. Mr. Stewart said that the surgeon pulled back that, that sheet, covered it back up, and what, and he threw up in the sink. <laughs> And Mr. Stewart said, I told the surgeon, I wish I had time to throw up too. So he went and looked at her and he said, well, she's not going to make it. She doesn't have a face. And he goes, well, yeah, I know. So they overdosed her with morphine and they killed her. Now she was buried in Potter's Field in a shipping container. This is, this is a big girl. <laughs> Her husband did go and spend time in prison, then he was let out. I actually found his obituary. He never remarried, and he still listed her as his wife, <laughs> which I thought was a little creepy. But anyway. So um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. So how old was she when he killed her? I think she's about 18. Parlor House closed down in 1949. Um, the Parlor House that she owned in Salida, that yes. Seems kind of late. Well, it's late because Salida had based um, everybody getting paid from the city, the police, the mayor, and everything on the fines that the girls had to pay. And when they closed everything down in 1913, about a month went by and they realized nobody could get paid. They didn't have the money in the in the treasury. So then they so, they, so they reopened her. Well, each town can make their own rules. Uh -huh. So Salida legalized it. Each girl had to, of course, they had to get a health check. They had to put the paper up on their door, and they had to pay their fine. They had rules. They, had to, um, they, they couldn't go past a certain street. They had to stay on their street. There's a lot of rules. They couldn't be drunk. They couldn't be loud. So they were all it was kind of like a little commune, I guess. <laughs> But it was just based on, you know, the city wanted the money. I mean, if it wasn't for the fact that the, at the commander guy at Camp Hale came down and insisted that they close them down, we probably still have a red light district in Salida. <laughs> yes? Oh, I, oh, I'm sorry, you well, raised it. I, did, I yeah. you were, uh, Well, I was just wondering about the age. I mean, this couldn't be a lifelong profession, right? I mean, what was the general... Or was it? I mean, well, the thing at, at no, not, like with, with Laura, what she had done was she knew that there's only a time span. Once you got into your late 30s, early 40s, you were done. Either you were going to get married off, or you're going to live off the money that you had saved, or you're going to own a parlor house. There was just, you were going to have to invest your money somehow. So what Laura did was talking to people like Mr. Stratton and different high-end people. She learned how to be a businesswoman. So she saved every dime that she made. She said, if I, bought a dress, if I got a dress, someone else paid for it. If I ate, someone else paid for that. She goes, I put all my money. When she bought the entire block, she paid cash for that. When she bought her car, she paid cash for it. She saved every dime that she had because she knew. Now, when they were going to close the parlor houses down in 1913, her whole idea was, well, I could always rent them out as apartments. That way, I still have a way to make a living. So she's a very, very smart businesswoman. But you're right. About your late 30s, early 40s, and you're about done. Well, like, was it unusual for them to marry or not? Oh, it was very, very common for them to marry. Actually, a lot of the miners and the railway men would actually go to the parlor houses, not the cribs, because the cribs were the worn out girls. They would go to the parlor houses to go and find wives. So actually, in my book, toward the, um, one of the last chapters in Salida, Laura actually had a picture of the girl when she was all cute and thin and adorable, and the picture of her after she got married. 
and it's, I put the picture side by side because it's kind of impressive what happens when somebody gets married versus when they're adorable and cute and get, you know, so they're side by side. But I actually met the people who that, who that was actually their, um, their aunt. I think it was their, their uncle's wife. And they, they said that she was always very, very quiet, was never able to have children because, of course, she was sterile, and that she was a very, very good cook. And you can see from the picture, she was a very, very good cook. <laughs> what did they take for birth control? You said something um, yeah, actually, in my Leadville chapter, what it is is Fern, the, the girl that you saw, she explained it. And there's also a, there's a thing called the Comstock Law. Now, the Comstock Law back in that time outlawed birth control. It was because Mr. Comstock and his wife could not have babies. They had one baby. It died. She was never able to get pregnant. So he decided, well, then we're never going to prevent another child from being born. So he made everything illegal. Doctors would tell people, oh, well, if you use birth control, you know, you're going to go crazy. You're going to go blind. You're going to get cancer. I mean, it was all these stupid reasons. But there was ways around it. Now, Mr. Colgate, of all people, invented a birth control that he could get around the law with. What he did was he made Vaseline, of course. We all know what Vaseline is. On the back of the Vaseline container, he would give you the directions on how to make this into birth control. That was legal. He had an, a certain kind of acid, this little powder, that you would purchase separately. Then you would mix it into the Vaseline according to the directions on the outside of the container, mix it together, and use it like a spermicide. So he was able to get around that law by not selling it mixed. And the one thing that they were told was the greased egg doesn't hatch, so they used a lot of Vaseline. <laughs> they also douched with Listerine. <laughs> and Lysol. And then they would also use it to clean their house and clean everything else. <laughs> that, of course, is what made a lot of the girls sterile, was because you can't really be douching with Listerine and Lysol and not become sterile. But yeah. But there was lots of different ways that they try to keep themselves from getting pregnant. Any other questions? Well, if anybody's interested, my book is either $18 by itself or $20 with a check. And you can come and you can pick out your own check. And next month, I'm going to be doing my presentation on my tunnels underneath the street. So that book is here, too. And if you have any questions, you can come up and look at it. <laughs>